You may start. I have received notice from the Minister of Health that he wishes to make a statement. Minister. Um, thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and thank you for the opportunity to update the House on my Department's surge planning agenda. Today I am publishing a new surge planning strategic framework intended to set the overarching context for individual trust surge and winter planning. Alongside that framework, I am also publishing individual trust surge plans. The coming period is highly uncertain, and the recent increase in COVID-19 cases is deeply concerning and shows that further waves is a continuing threat. How the virus develops in the coming weeks and months will depend on a range of factors, including the future approach to social distancing, population adherence to these measures, which include washing hands often and well, good respiratory practice, and the appropriate use of face coverings. Given the sheer scale of the unknown, I do believe that the health and social care system coped well through the first COVID-19 wave. That was largely because of the public's strong adherence to the measures put in place to counter the spread of the virus, meaning that the impact on services was not as severe as initially feared. Another important factor was the attendances at emergency departments reduced significantly during that period, which released capacity to assist with managing the pandemic. This may not be the case in the coming months, particularly as we move into the winter period. While the future path of the pandemic is unclear, as I have already indicated, a second wave will likely coincide with winter pressures. This means that we are very likely to face the most challenging winter ever experienced by our HSC system. The planning for the initial surge was carried out at a time when there was limited data available on the pandemic's trajectory. In this context, plans were put in place to deal with an extreme level of surge. As a result of this planning, every patient requiring treatment for COVID-19 was able to receive it. However, the creation of so much additional capacity had a significant, in, significant impact on our other HSC services. The scale of this impact is outlined in the Rebuilding HSC Services Strategic Framework. Mr Speaker, sadly, as of yesterday, 584 of our fellow, fellow citizens have passed away with COVID-19. No matter how long the pandemic continues, we must never forget that behind every figure was a person who was loved and who is now sorely missed. Mr Speaker, my sincere condolences go out to the families and loved ones of those who have tragically passed away. Our tribute to them as a community must be to ensure we take all necessary action to minimise the rate of infection and future loss of life. This starts with us all taking personal responsibility for our behaviour and actions in fighting this dreadful virus. Our nurses, doctors, paramedics, all our allied health professionals, community pharmacists, care workers, primary care, all our frontline health and social care workers and carers have bravely and tirelessly put themselves at risk to save the lives of others. Amongst them were also those who volunteered to return to work on a, on a temporary leave, training to provide much help and support. I cannot thank our workers enough for that. And I know that I can rely upon continued commitment from all staff as we begin the task of managing future COVID-19 waves. Having said that, Mr Speaker, I appreciate that the efforts to date have taken their toll. We must put staff welfare, along with patient safety, at the heart of our efforts to manage services. As I said in my opening remarks, I am deeply concerned about the increase in the number of infections in recent days and weeks. In parallel to preparing our health and social care services for future COVID-19 waves, I will not hesitate to bring recommendations to the Executive, as I did last week, for a tightening of social distancing measures, should these be necessary. We all have an important role to play in stopping the spread of the virus. I ask the people of Northern Ireland to maintain adherence to the social distancing rules, continue to wash your hands often, and practice good respiratory hygiene. I know that the vast majority do and I cannot overstate the importance of this. I would also urge all Northern Ireland residents who have not already done so to download the Stop COVID NI app. Well in excess of 415,000 people have downloaded the app as of yesterday, and over 5,700 people have received exposure notifications asking them to self-isolate. This is a key plank um, of our test, trace and protect strategy and a valuable source of up-to-date information. If we all play our part, I am confident that we can defeat this pandemic. 
In the meantime, my job is to ensure that our health and social care services are prepared to care for anyone who needs treatment or contacts the virus. The publication of the surge plan strategic framework is a key step in ensuring just that. I would now like to highlight key aspects of the surge planning strategic framework that I am publishing today. The surge planning strategic framework provides the overall structure and parameters within the HSC trusts, which they have developed, where they have developed their individual plans for managing the response to COVID-19 in the event of future waves. The framework highlights important learning from the first wave, sets out the approach to surveillance and modelling, reviews actions to minimise COVID-19 transmission and impact, summarises key regional initiatives to organise health and social care services to facilitate effective service delivery, highlights actions around the key issues of workforce, medicines and testing, and confirms a number of principles for our health and social care trusts to adopt when developing their individual surge plans. It is important to recognise that Northern Ireland specific data and modelling will continue to be used to enable efficient planning and ensure there is early warning of any impact on health and social care services. Using the available data combined with surveillance of influenza and other winter diseases, the Chief Medical Officer and Chief Scientific Advisor will continue to advise the Executive as it considers measures to reduce the R number in the event of a significant and sustained increase in the epidemic. With this approach, the intention is to ensure that the system is equipped to deal with a significant increase in demand, but also to keep the level of demand manageable in order to prevent our health and care services becoming overwhelmed. In order to manage future COVID-19 surges, um, HSC must be organised and ready to respond. To ensure that services are delivered most effectively in the COVID-19 context, the Department has taken a number of initiatives adopting regional approaches to service delivery. There are a number of key regional initiatives outlined in the surge planning strategic framework. These include establishing dedicated centres for day case and orthopaedic procedures, the establishment of a regional cancer reset cell to oversee the resumption of screening, diagnosis and treatment of cancer patients in clinically safe environments as quickly as possible, and to protect these services as much as possible in the event of future potential surges of COVID-19. It also includes action to capture learning in relation to care homes, to mitigate future transmission of the virus in those settings, and the continued availability of the critical care capacity at our first Nightingale facility at the Belfast City Hospital. It includes the additional step-down capacity at our second Nightingale facility at White Abbey Hospital, the much-expanded testing capacity and the publication of our Test Trace Protect strategy. The Nightingale facilities are particularly relevant for surge planning, and I will say more about my, my plans next. The Belfast City Hospital Tower Block was designated Northern Ireland's first Nightingale and will maintain additional ICU capacity for future COVID-19 waves. It should be noted that this additional ICU capacity will only be needed in the event of an extreme surge in demand for intensive care. The Belfast City Hospital Tower will remain a protected site for cancer and other specialist surgeries for as long as is possible. The experience of the first surge identified a role for additional step-down capacity to support flow through hospitals and ease pressures on the system. Therefore, as members will know, I have already commissioned work to begin on an additional Nightingale facility on the White Abbey Hospital site. This will be an immediate care facility providing 100 additional step-down beds to be operational by December 2020. Mr Speaker, some members will have heard uh, of the latest report published by the Royal College of Surgeons, focusing on the delivery of surgery through a second wave. Whilst the report may be largely focused on England, it does also importantly contain the views of surgeons from here in Northern Ireland. The report is an important contribution at this time, especially as it is coming from clinicians working on the very front line. I'm meeting the Royal College tomorrow morning, just as I've done on a number of occasions before, and I'm quite certain the report will be discussed then. I've also asked that the report and the recommendations in it are discussed at tomorrow's meeting of the Regional Management Board. A point in particular that I fully expect will be discussed tomorrow, and one which is referenced on page 22 of the report, is the relation to staffing. 
The responses from our surgeons highlight the significant impact workforce shortages are having on the capacity to deliver planned care. This was a problem before COVID and will remain so after COVID. However, the pandemic has only exacerbated it. Almost all of the surgeons responding to the survey specifically mentioned the need for more nursing staff to increase surgical capacity. It is clear that there are no quick fixes and sustainable multi-year funding is required. Earlier this year, I was pleased to secure funding to deliver an additional 300 nursing and midwifery undergraduate places in Northern Ireland this year, bringing the total to a new all-time high of 1,325. In the meantime, I will continue to do everything I can to train, attract and entice nurses to, or work, to work in our HSC systems. I recognise that it may be difficult to find any positives in the situation that we find ourselves in, but we must recognise that the emergency response across primary, community and secondary care services have involved innovative new service delivery approaches. Our health and social care providers have adopted the use of technology like never before. Whilst face-to-face -face consultations will always be necessary in some cases and indeed are valued by both clinicians and patients, I am also reassured that virtual clinics and telephone triage are widely embedded both in primary and secondary care services. Mr Speaker, we cannot go back to the way we delivered services before COVID-19. There is now an opportunity to mainstream these recent innovations and I am determined that we take that opportunity. Of course, we must recognise that the use of technology will not be appropriate in all circumstances, and we must continue to offer face-to-face -face services where that makes sense for patients and staff alike. Our primary and secondary care providers have also stepped up to collaborate in ways not previously seen. This is best exemplified in the 11 COVID-19 centres established as a response to the crisis. We must now build on these experiences to future encourage that collaboration. Mr Speaker, I can confirm to the House that innovation, transformation and collaboration will be at the very heart of my approach to managing a second wave. Before I move on to the trust surge plans, I think it is important not to forget to pay tribute to all those carers who supported their loved ones through this very difficult time. To them, I say you have done a fantastic job in a very challenging environment, and we must continue to support carers through this coming period, which will likely be at least as difficult as the last six months. Carers will have a crucial role to play in continuing to provide support, not only to those they care for, but also in terms of taking pr pressure off our hospitals and healthcare workers. Mr Speaker, I am also announcing today the publication of five individual trust surge plans and the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service Surge Plan. These plans all outline initiatives required to respond to additional demand pressures arising during the winter and through any subsequent COVID-19 waves. Each plan covers a number of themes to support the HSE system to deliver increased resilience through this challenging winter period. The themes include positive patient, service user and carers experience, protecting HSC staff, maximising capacity and promoting safety for patients and staff alike. Mr Speaker, I have highlighted the key aspects of the surge planning strategic framework and the individual surge plans that I am publishing today. This will ensure that comprehensive plans are in place to address both future COVID-19 surges and winter pressures. Our waiting times, Mr Speaker, were appalling before COVID-19, and regrettably, they will be even worse after COVID-19. That is why I made it clear to my officials and to the Trusts that restarting services was to be considered a key priority for them. COVID can cause real harm, but so too can delayed diagnosis or treatment. Thankfully, through the Herculean efforts of our clinicians and the administrative staff working across our Trusts, much progress was made. I can inform the House, um, for instance, that from the 1st of July to the 31st of August this year, trusts had committed under their planning to deliver 130,419 outpatient consultations, where in fact they delivered 152,941. Similarly, they aim to deliver 61,678 diagnostics whereas instead they delivered 81,874. 
I don't underestimate for one moment, however, the damage that COVID-19 has inflicted. That is why I said I wanted any and all possible sources of additional capacity to be utilised. This included capacity within the independent sector. And from the outset, outset of the pandemic, trusts have been using theatre sessions, including for both general anaesthetic lists and local anaesthetic lists, to allow many hundreds of the most urgent and time-critical patients to proceed as quickly as possible. When I established the Management Board for Rebuilding HSC Services in June, I also tasked it with incrementally increasing HSC service capacity as quickly as possible across all programmes of care. The Management Board is currently overseeing 28 work streams, and it is clear that huge efforts are underway to rebuild services. I do not underestimate either the scale of the challenge or the needs of patients who unfortunately have had their treatment delayed. The next set of Trust three-month rebuild plans were originally intended to be published at this time, covering the period October to December. However, given the perilous and developing situation we now find ourselves in, I feel we have no choice but to hold back on the publication of these latest plans. However, let me reassure members, just because the publications of the plans may be paused, that does not for one moment suggest the efforts of our clinicians to support patients has been paused. Because even with the prevailing COVID situation, I expect that the rebuilding effort will, of course, continue as far as that is possible. I will also keep the publication of the rebuild plans under ongoing review. And that said, it must be recognised that the recent rapid increase in COVID-19 infections is likely to unavoidably impact on the capacity of our health system to maintain delivery of mainstream services. Finally, I intend tomorrow to publish a policy statement setting out important plans for rebuilding and stabilising cancer services. While we have greatly improved our cancer treatment services with increasing numbers of patients, surviving cancer for longer periods, regretfully our waiting times for diagnosis and treatment have been deteriorating in recent years. HSC cancer services, primar primarily oncology, have been under pressure for some years. There are a number of reasons for the existing pressures, including staff vacancies, and sickness absence. In addition, the service is being supported by single-handed practitioners and locums, which makes it vulnerable. Unfortunately, the impact of COVID-19 on the health and social care system has also been profound. The continued need to adhere to social distancing and the level of use of PPE not required before the pandemic have all contributed. While every effort has been made by the HSC Trust to prioritise both red flag and urgent patient referrals, it will require some time to return these services to delivering the full available capacity. Alongside the development of the new cancer strategy, healthcare commissioners, uh, professional staff and the trusts have been working to produce short and medium-term plans to rebuild and stabilise cancer services. Both oncology and haematology services are under unprecedented pressure as a result of the continued growth in demand for services and the adverse impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. It is essential that we invest now to create sustainable teams that can provide high quality and timely care. The aim of these plans is to take immediate action to increase capacity and ensure that the services are sustained over the weeks and months ahead as we face the potential for a second wave of COVID-19. The rebuilding plan for cancer services contains 17 actions to maximise available capacity across all cancer services. The immediate need is to rebuild services following the COVID-19 first wave and maintain service delivery for red flag and urgent referrals for the year ahead. The estimated investment for the rebuilding plan is £2.5 million revenue recurrent uh, for the rebuilding plan and £151,000 capital. The oncology and haematology stabilisation plans are focused on filling medical, nursing and allied health professional vacancies. Investing in new ways of working and creating new navigator posts to support the continued delivery of virtual clinics. The overall estimated cost of the oncology stabilisation plan is £8.73 million over two years. The overall estimated cost of the haematology stabilisation plan is £3.63 million, also over two years. Whilst this work will initially support it through COVID funding, it is important to note that these are not short-term actions. 
the executive has agreed that this investment will be rolled out across two years um, through to March 2022 and will be recurrently funded from 2022-23. There is an urgent need to rebuild cancer services and these plans complement each other by providing a strong base for the long-term implementation plan to underpin the cancer strategy called for in the new decade, new approach document. Mr Speaker, in conclusion, uh, be in no doubt that we are confronted with a huge and daunting challenge. We must, as a system, try to rebuild service, services, manage the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, embed innovation and transformation, address winter pressures and plan for the future, all at the same time. We demonstrated during the first COVID-19 wave, and despite the limited time to prepare, that we are up for the challenge. It is due to the dedication of all our health and social care staff that anyone who has contracted this terrible virus has had access to the best possible care. I am determined that this will continue to be the case. I am immensely proud of all our health and social care staff. You responded selfishly and with conviction to the first COVID-19 wave. The period we are now facing is likely to be hugely challenging, but I have no doubt that our HSC staff will again respond positively, positively to the challenge. It will be critically important to adopt a flexible approach to ensure that mainstream health and social care services delivery is maximised as far as possible. Our ability to protect mainstream health and social care services will at least in part be determined by everyone responding positively to control the spread of the virus. I urge everyone across the community to go that extra mile this winter by following the guidance on infection prevention and not to let our guard slip. Mr Speaker, I can assure the House that I will bring to bear all the leadership and encouragement that I can offer as we move through what will undoubtedly be an increasingly testing period for health and social care. Mr Speaker, I commend the surge planning strategic framework and trust surge plans to the House. I call Colum Gildenew to ask Last can call you and uh, Minister for coming to the, the Assembly this morning to make this statement and also for taking time to meet with myself and the Deputy Chair earlier to discuss issues issues around health. Also to uh, to I would like to join in your remarks in terms of your condolences to all who have suffered uh, the loss of loved ones as a result of this uh, horrible virus. And to recognise that we are in a different place, hopefully this time, while it's a very worrying situation that faces, faces us, we, are in the, we have an active testing and tracing uh, system in place, and it's crucial that that keeps pace with demand in, in the time ahead and meets the challenges that it's facing. And also, uh, in terms of PPE, we're, we're hopefully in a different place. I also welcome the ongoing work on the dedicated day case and orthopaedic centres and the commitment to protect services as much as possible from shutdown while recognising there are issues with orthopaedic in, in the Western Trust. But Minister, the committee has heard that one of the key differences in places that have fared better in suppressing the virus than, than here has been the availability of isolation facilities uh, to provide people with support where they find it difficult to isolate at home or to return home to isolate, high multiple occupancy houses, younger people, issues like that. Can the Minister tell us if he is uh, willing to look into this area that, that may be something that we could improve upon? And also, can the Minister tell us more about what is different in respect of cure homes this time around and what plans there are in place, for example, to ensure safe discharge from hospital into what we recognise as a very vulnerable setting of care homes? Um, and, and I thank the Chair um, of the committee again for, for his support and his committee's support um, through what has been a challenging time. In regards to, to the self-isolation facilities, we don't have bespoke provision um, here in Northern Ireland for anyone who has to self-isolate. But as, as I said when we met earlier on, when we did have that conversation, it's a conversation I'm willing to have uh, with the Communities Minister to see what can be done. One of the provisions that our step-down facility in White Abbey, uh, our Nightingale facility, when it is opened, will allow those transferring uh, from hospital settings actually another uh, facility to go to that will separate them from mainstream hospital provision, but also prevent them having to go into to care home settings. In regards to the specifics of the, the transfer from hospitals um, to trans from from hospitals and to care homes, um, as per paragraph 27 in, in the plan of the latest version of the care homes guidance, 
um, all patients being discharged from hospital to a care home should be tested for COVID-19 ideally. Um, this test will be done 48 hours prior to discharge. In addition, those patients and residents who are entering a care home through another route, even from, you know, from home or from a supported living service, should be tested in advance of their entry into that care home. And ideally, as I said, this test will be done 48 hours prior to the entry prior to the entry to make sure that anybody entering a care home has been tested and that the self-isolation does then take place um, as suggested. But the member you know, asks the question of what have we learned in regards to care homes. I think the piece of work that the Chief Nursing Officer led in regards to the Rapid Learning Initiative uh, and to care homes has identified quite a number of, of issues that we have learned from, we've picked up in regards to uh, PPE, you know, bringing GPs into care homes, the virtual assessment, the virtual wards. There's been a lot of good work there. But one of the strengthening tools that we have had is our testing of care homes, not just the residents, but also the staff uh, as well. The chair will be aware, I think, yesterday's, um, yesterday's figures showed we had 28 care homes uh, where we had positive uh, supportive patients. Um, of those 28, 24 of them were identified through our testing programme. So they actually picked up uh, either residents or, or staff who may have been asymptomatic, uh, that wouldn't have been displaying symptoms that we wouldn't have known about. So by that testing program, we've been able to identify those, um, those, those staff members and those residents quickly and get them isolated. So that provides that added protection uh, to ensure that we don't see the, the outbreaks of the number or the intensity that we actually did in the first surge. I call Pam Cameron. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister of Health for his statement to the House this morning. Um, Minister, you've mentioned workforce shortages as a key problem. Can you update uh, the House on the retention of those recruited from retirement, etc., earlier in the year, and any further plans to address recruitment in the short term? Um, and again, you know, the member had you know, the, the crucial issue that it is. We can open as many beds, as many wards, as many facilities um, as we want, but if we don't have the trained available staff actually to, to, to facilitate the delivery and the care, um, that bit's pointless. It was a challenge, if the member remembers back, you know, when this place came back on the 11th of January, one of our first achievements was to bring our, our nurses and our healthcare workers off the picket line. At that point, we thought an additional 300 nursing, nursing and midwifery places per year uh, for the next three years was a big achievement. We already know now that we have an excess of 2,000 uh, nursing vacancies alone in our current health care system. So there's a lot of work to be done, and a lot of work has been done uh, in investing in the staff that we currently have, but making sure that we can attract uh, staff from elsewhere, but also encourage the staff that we have to stay. And it's been one of my challenges as Minister is to make the HSC as an employer for choice. It's a challenge at this time of year, um, as a challenge at any time of year and during the COVID pandemic it has been particularly challenging but as I said in my opening statements um, the dedication, the commitment that I've seen from our healthcare workforce um, from nurses, doctors, community pharmacy uh, porters, healthcare workers, cleaners, canteen workers is above, above um, I think any commitment that we could possibly ask but the dedication that they've delivered is something that I think we should be proud of and it's definitely as Minister that I'm proud of. Aram, sir, Justin McNulty for your cash. I call Justin McNulty for. Um, can I thank you, Minister, for your statement today, and can I thank you for your steady leadership throughout this pandemic, Minister? I think everybody in the Health and Social Security Service and all the people out there recognise the confidence that you give them your steady uh, guidance through this pandemic. Can I ask you for your comments, Minister, in terms of the recommendation from the Royal College of Surgeons? relation to ring fencing beds, and can you confirm that emergency surgery will be returning to Daisy Hill on the resumption of the ED department in the coming weeks? Thank you very much, Minister. Um, you know, I, I welcome the proposal from the Royal College of Surgeons in, in relation to the ring fencing beds and staff for elective surgery. When I first took up this, this post long before COVID, one of the challenges was actually for theatre nurses because of the specific skill set um, that they, they bring and they, they are needed, and that still is it. That still is a challenge. And again, as I said in the statement, I, I, I'm looking forward again to discussing the proposals in more detail when I meet with the Royal College um, tomorrow because I have had uh, regular engagement with them. 
The decisions I have already taken to implement day cases and orthopaedic surgery centres and manage these services on a regional basis are actually entirely consistent with the direction of the Royal College proposals. And as I said, I'll be asking the Rebuild Management Board to, to consider the Royal College of Surgeons, Surgeons proposals tomorrow. And as I said earlier on, during July and August, our trust succeeded uh, the planned inpatient and day case procedures set out in their phase uh, two rebuild plans. A total of just over 7,500 proce procedures were planned, and in fact, almost 10,400 procedures were delivered, whereas these were above. What, what was planned and what was estimated we could do, and that increase is welcome. It only starts to, to eat in the, into our, our waiting lists. In regards to the specifics of, of Daisy Hill, I don't have that detail in front of me, but if the member uh, refers to the rebuilding plans and the surge plans for the trust, I'm sure he'd find that included there. If it's not, I'll get the, uh, they'll get the member an update. Call Alan Chambers. My thoughts today are with all the families affected by this dreadful virus. Uh, can the Minister comment on whether there was any engagement with the key stakeholders in advance of today's framework? And can he give a commitment that the framework, as well as the individual trust surge plans, will be kept under constant review and that all decisions will be heavily informed by the views of clinicians working on the ground? I, I, I can give the, the, the member those reassurances that you know, these are living documents. They're not tablets of stone because of what we've seen um, over the past few months. And I think what we've also seen in the ability for our health and social care system to react and change, something that, that I think many in this House or many outside had never thought was it possible that it could be, could be so flexible. But one of the things that and, uh, I, I've been asked and challenged in previous documents when we reached it was about the level of engagement. Um, given the speed um, at which this virus is currently spreading, it's imperative you know, that we plan now for, for the surges and the winter pressures. But despite um, the need to move swiftly, um, I felt it was important to engage with key st stakeholders on the surge planning strategic framework. I therefore initiated a very short uh, engagement exercise with key stakeholders, which included our trade union colleagues, professional colleges and bodies, the HSC Arms Length Body Chairs, and the voluntary and community sector and service users, and that was done through our Transformation Advisory Board members. And I thank all the stakeholders for their valuable input, which has informed and changed some of our initial surge planning strategic framework, which was, was published today. So in total, 18 responses were received as part of that, that exercise. I gave commitments uh, to this House in the past and to the committee that I would engage. We have engaged, and I'm thankful for the productive engagement. Uh, that those, those stakeholders had with us in preparing this, this strategic framework. Thank you. Paula Bradshaw. The Speaker, Minister, in regard to the £600 million allocated for dealing with the additional pressures and needs in um, dealing with COVID, are you confident that this will be enough um, to deal with um, this new surge plan? And what new treatments are to be introduced now that we know more about how the virus affects the body? Thank you. Um, you know, and I thank the member, member for her question, and I, I caught some of the, the commitment from the, the Finance Minister earlier on. In regards to the £600 million, I'm con because it has to be spent in this financial year, I'm content that it actually does cover all our financial asks that we know we are able to deliver, because there's no point in me overbidding and not being able uh, to spend in this financial year. Sorry, what was the last part, Paula? That are going to be introduced, like allied health professionals, because now we know more about how the the virus affects the body? Yeah. Um, look, I think the member raises that point, which is now even a new medical definition, which has been called long COVID, or, you know, and that's the after effects, because what we're seeing this virus just isn't solely respiratory, it affects the, the blood circulation system, it can even, even, even affect some other mobility issues as well. So the more we learn about this virus, the more challenge we have across our entire health and social care system. Our allied health professionals are taking a lead in how we get that recovery, that recuperation, get people back on their feet, get their muscles uh, strength built up as well. But also the need that we also um, have identified through the support from our mental health facilities and practitioners as well. Because what we know is now this will have a long-term detrimental impact on the mental health of anyone who either contracted but also of the populace of Northern Ireland and that's why I was extremely keen that we built in that, um, that section of COVID-19 into our mental health um, strategic plan as well because that will lead to a 10-year plan because I think the, 
the, the, the mental health challenges that COVID uh, will present in our general population won't be sorted in a short-term plan. It will be a long-term commitment and a long-term dedication. So that's where we're looking to in regards to you know, what learnings are we having from where this virus actually affects the general well-being and physical and mental well-being of our population. Call Paul Given. Speaker, uh, the Minister's statement makes reference to the appropriate use of face coverings. Uh, is that an indication that the Minister is concerned that face masks have provided a false sense of security for some people, which has undermined the social distancing message and the regular hand washing, washing uh, message, and that there needs to be the appropriate use of them for it to be effective? And furthermore, the Minister will be aware of what happened in the uh, Republic of Ireland and the breakdown between the government and the Chief Medical Officer. Observers have commented on the number of occasions when our Chief Medical Officer and Chief Scientific Officer have recommended or made recommendations publicly that they would then want the Executive to implement. What measures is he taking to ensure that we don't have a repeat um, in the Northern Ireland Executive of what has happened in the Republic of Ireland, which is damaging to everybody involved? Um, can, can I just say, and I'll take the member's second point first. I think whenever the Chief Medical Officer and Chief Scientific Advisor speak, they speak with the authority um, of their offices and their experience and, and their medical medical experience, but they're always caveated and I think they're always managed and measured in the fact they always refer to that any decision will be a decision that is taken by by the executive. So they make recommendations. Those recommendations are made to me and to all the executive colleagues as well. And we have a very good working relationship and understanding as to, to what needs to be done and what is, what is done for the best interests of Northern Ireland across the entire piece. Um, our Chief Medical Officer, Chief Scientific uh, Advisor also uh, bring to the table an understanding of the economic and societal impacts that the, the health recommendations that they bring forward um, actually will have. And they do take a balanced and professional approach. And I think um, their input is something that we in Northern Ireland should actually value. Um, I can't see at any stage where we will end up in the divergence that we seem to see between the, some within the Irish Republic's government and their medical professionals, because I think we have a truly um, exceptional team uh, in our Chief Medical Officer and Chief Scientific Advisor and the way they carry out their professional posts and providing that advice, advice and guidance um, to the executive um, as a whole. In regards to the appropriate use of face coverings, what I mean in that is for those who have um, reasons not to wear them, uh, should it be medical, should it be psychological, uh, what I would like to see is actually an increased use of face coverings in the appropriate settings and in all settings. And I think we should actually encourage and regulate more uh, in those areas where we don't see compliance with face coverings where they should be worn, and I mean specifically in the retail sector, because as we go into this second wave, we need to be doing um, all that we can to support those who are most vulnerable and need that extra bit of protection that we can give uh, to other individuals, and we do that by wearing those face coverings in the appropriate settings. Here and there, Liz Kimmins, for your cash. I call Liz Kimmins for a question. And I thank the Minister for coming this morning. Um, and it's a very compre comprehensive statement. It's very welcome and commend the significant amount of work that has been done uh, thus far. Um, and it, it's gone back, I suppose, around, around the issue of the response to COVID. And, and you'll be well aware at this stage, Minister, the, the concerns that had been there in, in terms of the relocation of, of Daisy Hill's emergency department. And it's very welcome and very positive that it's now coming back on the 19th. And there's been a lot of, of work done around that. Um, and, uh, and my experience as, an, as a representative for, for Newry for almost seven years now, we've always had to fight for the retention of services in Daisy Hill. So naturally enough, any moves to make changes causes concern within the community. Um, and, and we work very, very hard to ensure that, that we can allay those fears. But as the member for uh, Nuri Armagh alluded to, there has been concerns around the future of emergency sur surgery um, for Daisy Hill. And I'm fresh out of a meeting this morning with the Chief Executive for the Southern Trust, and I suppose I can answer the member's question that emergency surgeries are returning on the 19th uh, of October. Excuse me, does the member have a question, please? Yes, I'm just getting uh, to it. Yep. Uh, um, but I suppose one of the issues around that was that a correspondence had been issued on the 22nd of September stating that, that there wouldn't be. So that's where the concerns come from. However, this is a short-term 
plan. And I just want to ask the Minister, can your department give assurances that on a longer term basis that they are committed to ensuring that the downgrading of Daisy Hill will not happen in terms of acute surgeries? I've given previous credit and I'm glad you were able to give that, that date. I, I, I didn't have it. It is a welcome, a welcome commitment. But I think what we're seeing in regards to the surge planning and the three month building plans, uh, if that commitment, that, that emergency surgery has started, it will be there in that step phase. We can provide that long term commitment, I think, to any service at this moment in time while, until we get through COVID. As one of the things I've always done as Minister should have been in regards to the supplies of PPE, I've never com give a commitment that I cannot stand over when I'm saying it. So I can't give the member that commitment, but I'll ensure that we do all that we can to retain those services where they are safe to retain and where they are needed to retain as well. So I hope the member takes me at my word. I'll not give any other commitments that, that I can't stand over, and I won't do that to the member, um, but I will give her the commitment. Look, one of the things that we do know is that no matter where we are now, I don't have a large enough footprint for hospital provision in Northern Ireland to do what we need to do on a safe basis when you take into social, uh, social distancing and the need for, for distancing for people who are waiting, for people who are getting surgeries and all the rest of it. So every footprint that I have within my health and social care system, I'm using. That's why we've used the White Abbey facility as the, the second Nightingale facilities because it's something that's already it's already in our, in our ownership and already in our, our care as well, so it made sense to redevelop that as our, our second nightingale. Call George Robinson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and can thank the Minister for his statement as well. And could I ask the Minister what is the importance of hands, face, space in order to help keep health services open moving through this horrible pandemic? And could I ask him as well uh, as we are now in the second horrific wave of this virus, could a testing centre be set up somewhere in East, East Londonderry? I thank the member um, for his question. You know, and hands, face, space is that message uh, that we've been putting through every member uh, of the health committee, ourselves in the Department of Health. Every healthcare professional has been pushing and has been asking the member of, of every member of the population in Northern Ireland. Um, to maintain and observe hands, good hand hygiene, uh, face, face coverings, which I see the member is wearing in space, which is the social distancing that we should be maintaining at all times, which is the recommended two metres. By following those simple steps, we prevent the spread um, of COVID-19. COVID-19 does not spread itself. We spread it. So by observing the hands, face and space, that simple, those simple stages, we can prevent the spread of, of COVID-19. In regards to the, the establishment of a, a testing centre in, in East London, there we have a number of fixed base testing centres. We also have a number of mobile testing units that we can move um, around Northern Ireland where we see large scale incidences of positive COVID-19 outbreaks. One of the things, and I know the member will be aware of representing that area, one of our lowest local districts for the expansion of positive cases in Northern Ireland is actually Causeway Coast and Glens, part of the the council area that the member represents. I would rather maintain a low number of COVID outbreaks by the members of that area and the residents of that area following face, um, hands, face and space. I think I got that right. Rather than having to need to put in a testing facility. So the, the members of uh, the, the residents of the members constituency are doing what they're meant to do. I would encourage them to do more and in that way will not need a testing facility in East London area. Iram Sir Pachihan for your case. I called Pachihan. Kerma the last count Kurla, August Puegas Lashanara, a Sokta Righteous or Margin, August a Kodj Fragre or Margin Kumai. I thank the Minister for the statement this morning uh, and for his answers so far. I wonder uh, could the Minister commit uh, to supporting health and social care staff, uh, particularly those staff who may be absent from work? while ill with COVID-related illness, and can he ensure that they will get their, their full wages rather than just statutory sick pay? Um, I thank the member for his ask. It's something we have looked at in the past, and I think the member will also be aware it's one of the steps that we put in regards to care home staff and domiciliary staff. It's part of that package of support that we provided through through those providers, even through the independence providers, so that we could ensure that it was 
it wasn't necessary for someone in a care home or domiciliary care setting who did contact COVID that financial pressures made them go back to work, that that, uh, that ability to, to supplement their, their statutory sick pay so that it wasn't, that there wasn't as, as I say, so there wasn't that financial incentive or need for them to turn to work, but they actually took the time um, to self-isolate and took that 14 days to make sure that they weren't spreading COVID if they did receive a positive case. So, so that, that supplementary, that, that support measure is still there. I think it expires um, at the end of this month, but as we go into the second phase, it's definitely something that I'll be seeking to continue and receiving financial support and ask for financial support to do, because it is an, it is an important and vital tool in our box to prevent the spread of COVID-19 within what is a, a very critical workforce, but a very undervalued workforce. Aaron, Sir Pat Catney, for your cash, I call Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for coming to the House today. Can the Minister confirm that our track and trace system runs on something a little bit more robust than Microsoft uh, Excel, so as to avoid, uh, Minister, any recorded mistakes? Um, I think the members um, slightly confusing two different, two, two, two different, two different scenarios. I, th I think that um, it's the number of positive cases that were recorded and how it was being recorded through a testing system, which um, across the water was then being manually transferred onto another system. And I didn't know Excel actually ran out uh, when you got to a certain number of cells. Um, our, our test system protect system, which is held uh, within the public health system, has developed. Um, and is developing a very spo bespoke software package originally. Um, and I, 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 if I'm not correct in this, I'll get back to the member, but I'm originally led to believe that the initial software package was actually one that was used for a hotel booking system because it allowed, member, it allowed our test chase and protect staff to follow through contacts and the use of, use of contacts as well. But I think it has moved on a wee bit from that, and I don't think our test chase and protect system actually relies on on Excel Word uh, or Excel spreadsheets, but I'm sure it's a, a pretty robust system for anybody that needs to use it. I call Mike Nesbitt. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The, the Minister concluded his statement by urging everyone in the community to go the extra mile uh, with regard to the pandemic. I'm sure I'm not the only MLA whose inbox has seen a recent spike uh, in correspondence from what we might call pandemic deniers. What is the Minister's message to those people? Again, I, I think I, I've rehearsed my, my message to, to those individuals many times um, to think about their message, not just the message that they put out, but the damage that it does um, uh, by undermining the health message that, that we put out, the health message that comes out from, from, from this place. For, for everyone that hears that message and doesn't wear a face covering, doesn't wash their hands, doesn't practice good respiratory hygiene, has the ability, has the chance of contracting COVID-19, spreading COVID-19, and putting additional pressures on our health and social care system, putting pressures which sees another nurse having to wear additional PPE, puts pressures on our ICU beds, puts pressures on our doctors, and then starts to challenge the delivery of our, our health service across the whole system. Um, so what I would say to those, mem or those individuals um, who think it is smart, who think it is clever uh, to put out that denial, is to think of the, the, adverse, um, uh, uh, the adverse implications that their actions are actually having on the general public of Northern Ireland, but those who are most vulnerable and those who, like me, are also asking everyone who can follow that guidance of good respiratory hygiene, good hand hygiene and social distancing to actually practice it. Call Alex Easton. Mr Deputy Speaker, thank the Minister for his statement. Um, Minister, in your statement, you mentioned about the Stop COVID uh, app and over 400,000 people have downloaded it. What more do you think you can do to try and encourage more people to download that? Because I think it's an essential tool to tackling the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I thank the member for, for, for his question. I suppose it is the ongoing development um, of that app, of what it contains and the additional information uh, that is actually contained on it. Uh, one of the biggest steps that we've taken recently was in, was in the last week, uh, working with the, the Children and Young People's Commissioner was um, we were able to, to facilitate it being downloaded by those under 18 
So it opened it up to a completely different tranche of, of people in Northern Ireland. And that's why we went from 380,000 downloads at the end of last week to over 415 at the start of this week. So we're seeing a new, a new generation actually downloading it and seeing the advantage um, that it does bring. Um, it's not a new innovation uh, for the app, but one of its key, its key abilities is that ability to work across the border. Uh, and we've seen that actually come to, come to fruition and come to real benefit in the recent weeks, where we've actually seen in the region of 13, 1,300 uh, downloads going from the Republic, uh, or identification keys coming from the Republic into Northern Ireland, and 1,200 from Northern Ireland going to the Republic of Ireland residents as well. So that interoperability that our app has that enables it to work in both jurisdictions is a key, a key strength to it that really stands us in good stead here in Northern Ireland. I'm Sir Emma Rogan for New Cash. I call Emma Rogan. I too um, want to thank the Minister for his statement here this morning, but can I ask the Minister, can he list the local groups, staff, trade unions and other organisations that his department consulted with when the decision was made to downgrade the A&E department of the Down Hospital in my own constituency of South Down? Um, it's, it, it's not something that I, I prepared for, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, as it is does move away. But what I will say in regards to the emergency department um, in the Down, I do know there was a, an issue, a, a statement actually released last night by the Trust um, that says since the end of July 2020, uh, they made clear that in their statement they have had further staffing challenges. Therefore, it's now clear that they are no longer able to fully restore the emergency services provided pre-COVID at this time. However, the Trust recognises the need to improve access to urgent and emergency care services for the local population in the Down area. So from the 19th of October, as the next phase of rebuilding urgent and emergency care services, a consultant-led urgent care centre will open in the Downs Hospital's emergency department, and this will operate from 8am to 6pm Monday to Friday uh, on an appointment-only basis, and there will be a nurse-led minor injury service continuing at weekend from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., and there will be a contact number. Those contacting the service will be triaged and offered an appointment within the urgent care service or directed to the most appropriate service. So it's not that it's being removed, it's being that the next step is actually being taken in rebuilding it by uh, initiating that, uh, that consultant-led urgent care centre, which will be operating on a Monday to Friday. Here my Mayor Emma Sheeran. For your cash, I call Emma Sheeran. I thank the Minister for his statement this morning and for his answers thus far. Can I ask the Minister what steps um, you're going to be taking to work with counterparts in the South um, to ensure that this COVID surge plan uh, will work to prevent spread of the virus, particularly in border regions? I thank the Member. And the Member may not be aware, but um, our party colleague, um, uh, the junior minister, Declan Kearney, and myself met on the North South Ministerial Council in health format on Friday, and that was one of the issues that we did cover, how, not only in regards to this, this surge plan, but how in regards that there is, um, there is an understanding on both sides of the border of where, how, where and how we counter and challenge COVID, should that be through, as I said earlier on, uh, the interoperability of our app, but also the understanding as we see the spread of the virus on both sides of the border, like in Derry, uh, city and Strabon Council area and Donegal as well, where we are seeing the same, the same rates of increase and the same incidence of, of spread, be that be, should that be from you know, community transmission as well. So there has been a good working knowledge, but not just between myself uh, and my ministerial counterpart in the Republic of Ireland, but also by our chief medical officers, our chief scientific advisors and our public health agencies. So there is a good understanding of what we are doing. There's a memorandum of understanding which formalises that engagement of information, and now there's a request that our public health agencies actually work closer together um, in regards to identifying outbreaks and causes of outbreaks, as we've seen along a number of the border regions. Mayor Matthew Tool, for Hanya Kesh, I call Matthew Tool. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm pleased to see my um, my colleagues back next to me, um, Daniel McCross, and I'm sure will be asking a question in a second. 
I would echo what, um, uh, what Emma Rogan said actually about South Down. First of all, I think people, people there will be keen to hear clarity about whether it moves back to emergency department. But I had two specific questions, Minister. Thank you for your update today. One is it's referred to in the surge plan, but are you completely confident that we have adequate supply of ventilators both in and outside Nightingale for the months to come? And secondly, can you give some clarity on provision of flu jabs? And how that's going? Is he confident of supply across uh, across Northern Ireland for vulnerable people, but also particularly for um, HSE staff? In, in regards to to the two points, Deputy, Deputy Speaker, um, since March 2020, the critical care network has procured 180 intensive care ventilators and 24 advanced patient transport ventilators to supplementing our existing devices uh, in treating our sick, sick patients. Of these orders, 124 ventilators have been received, allocated and commissioned for use in HSC trusts, and the remaining 80 ventilators are awaited from the supplier and they are expected in completion at the end of this month. In addition to that, 145 non-invasive ventilators devices have been procured for use by respiratory services in the region, as well as 300 high-flow oxygen devices. Each trust has identified local surge plans to meet additional surge demand for both COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 patients, and the regional inventory of 348 invasive, invasive ventilation devices, uh, which includes the 80 expected by the end of October, exceeds the current anticipated demand. Um, while equipment will not be a limiting factor in the provision of critical care to patients in Northern Ireland, there is considerable stress on limited staff resources, and there is no room um, for complacency. In regards to, to the flu vaccine, um, last year, 2019-2020, 670,000 flu vaccine doses were administered in Northern Ireland. I can inform the member that over one million doses have been procured for this year's programme in order to meet anticipated increased demand for eligible groups and allow for the vaccination of additional priority groups. And the amount procured for Northern Ireland this year is the maximum amount available to order to, get, to date given global demand for the flu vaccines. The target groups, the current groups eligible for free flu vaccination, are everyone aged 65 and over, pregnant women, those aged under 65 years of age in clinical at-risk groups, those who are in receipt of a carer's allowance, or those who are a main care or the care of an elderly or disabled person whose welfare may be at risk if the carer falls ill. All children aged two to four, or primary school pupils, and frontline health and social care workers. Um, in regards to the delivery of the flu vaccine to your health and care system, that has already started, and a number of peer vaccinators have been, have been trained, have already started uh, delivering the flu vaccine across the health and social care system. I am Sir Daniel McCrossan for New Cash. I call Daniel McCrossan, and I would just wish the member well. It's good to see him back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and it is good to be back. It's been a long few weeks, uh, Minister. Uh, as you'll know, uh, in the wider community, there's some uh, speculation from um, uh, th those who have difficulty with the testing system. Uh, can you provide any reassurance or assurances to the public and to this House, Minister, that, uh, as to how accurate the tests are? Um, what I will I'll, I'll start by welcoming the member back. Um, Mr Nesbitt, in an earlier um, answer, uh, asked what could I say to those people who deny uh, that COVID is real, uh, that it is a hoax, that it is a mythology. Um, I you know, I'll ask the member to, to maybe update later on in, in some shape or form that if what he went through felt like a hoax or a conspiracy or a mythology, because anybody that I have spoken to that has come through COVID-19 or any family who has lost someone due to COVID-19 or any member of our health and social care staff system who has treated somebody with COVID-19 knows it's not a hoax and I welcome the member back to his place. There's a number of tests that we use. I don't have the specific specificity or the reproducibility of those tests with me, but I can provide them to the member because I know it has been something that has been asked on a number of occasions. Um, so there's different tests used in different locations. Uh, I'll get that to the member in writing, uh, but I wish him well and welcome him back to the House. I call Jim Allister. Thank you. I I join in the welcome back to Mr. McCrossan. Um, I don't for a moment downplay the threat of COVID, nor do I diminish the fact that 584 people have died. 
But I am also conscious that in the first six months of this year, 2,302 people died from cancer, and who knows how many deaths have been hastened by the delays in cancer treatments. So when we reach a point when, for those last six months, the Department basically has been caught in the headlights of COVID, when we reach a point where the Royal College of Surgeons has to say that we need to ring fence staff and facilities for necessary surgical procedures, etc. Does that at all suggest to the Minister that the medical advice he's been relying on that has caused the Royal College of Surgeons to have to make that point, that that medical advice has been in somewhat flawed? Um, no, I don't, because the Royal College of Surgeons have been part of that medical advice that we have received. Um, the Royal College of Surgeons I actually sit on the rebuilding board as well. I meet with them regularly. The point they make in regards to uh, ring fencing beds and ring fencing staff is to protect those staff and those beds and those facilities from COVID as well, and to ensure that we can continue with the surgery that we have started. So the Royal College of Surgeons in their ask of ring fence and beds and ring fence and staff has been an ask that has been made um, for a long time. Um, the member will know that our health um, and social care system is already badly bruised and scarred by COVID, but it is picking itself um, up and once again is ready to care for, for all of us despite the immense pressures on the staff. So when I hear that the the call from the Royal College of Surgeons, it's not a surprise to me. It's an engagement I've had with them, and it's a message that they've carried forward about the protection. And that's why we've looked to the elective day care centres in Lagan Valley. That's why we've established the orthopaedic centres as well, so that we can create those facilities that are COVID neutral. They'll never be COVID free, we can never guarantee that, but that's why we're taking those steps. And in regards to my statement earlier on, he'll note uh, the announcement that's coming forward tomorrow when I publish that cancer strategy as well. In regards, in regards to haematology and oncology as well, because that is something that we know we have to address and get on top of as well, on a regional basis, no longer you know, uh, the, the way we were, were looking at it across trusts. I call Claire Sugden. Deputy Speaker, um, the recent rise in the rate of infection should give us all con con cause for concern, not least so that we don't overwhelm the NHS, thereby preventing the quality of care to the most vulnerable, suffering from the effects of COVID-19 or indeed any other illness. And Minister, I do appreciate your attention regarding access to other health and social care services for other illnesses, but I do think it's a lesson that we learned from the first wave and you yourself had expressed concern about the limited number of people accessing services that they should be accessing. I'm concerned that this will compound, be compounded in a second wave. Um, I have constituents coming into my office begging me for appointments and telling me that they're going to pay private for their child to see a doctor that they should be able to access on the NHS at a time when they can't afford to do that because there is a chance they, they are at risk of losing their jobs. How do we genuinely address this? I don't think it's good enough to say that you call your GP, wait on the phone all day long to be told, go to A&E if it's an emergency, because that's the experience my constituents are having. And I suppose to kind of follow on from Mr Alistair's point, we do need to be uh, looking after those who are suffering the effects of COVID-19. Of course we do, but we also need to be looking after those who are suffering the effects of all other illnesses, because they are ruining people's lives just as much as this virus. Um, I thank the member for her comment. As I said earlier, um, you know, I listened to the Finance Minister uh, statement before I came into the House, and he spoke of nine years underinvestment um, in the health service. It's a line that I used in this House previously when I took over. We are now reaping um, the, the, the shock of that underinvestment, where we don't have the number of beds, where we don't have the number of staff, and where we don't have the access to the health service that I think we, as a population in Northern Ireland, deserve, that we don't have a health service that our staff working in it deserve um, because of that structural long-term um, underinvestment. And, you know, th this place has, has a place to bear in that and a responsibility um, to bear as well. So when we talk about access to, to other services, it's because we currently have, I think, in the region of over 2,000 nurse 
nursing vacancies. We have a number of um, GP vacancies that we can't fill. Now we're looking to invest in those in McGee um, in the, the, the medical centre and the nurse training places that we're bringing forward. But there is no doubt that we do not have the number of people within our health service that we need there to be able and readily accessible. So to the members' constituents when, I, when, when they do say it, it's not, it's not a service that I want them to experience. I want their GPs to be as open and as accessible as possible, you know, and working with the Royal College of General Practitioners, the British Medical Association uh, Committee, Committee of, of General Practitioners, um, they have issued statements that have encouraged their members to be more open than, as, as, as open as they can and to access as many patients as they can. But, but on, on the counter of that, you know, I've also heard, I've also heard of the example where a mother um, t phoned the GP about her child and the GP referred them to a COVID centre because they were expressing COVID symptoms and the mother didn't want to take the child to a COVID centre in case, in case they caught COVID. So we need that education uh, as well of, of, the, of while we go through this pandemic of the different avenues that are being opened up and to make sure that people access uh, health care provision when they need it, but where they need it as well. There's a large, work, large job of work uh, to be done, I think, by ourselves. Uh, and by the medical professions, just to make sure that people do get access. It's not good enough, and it needs to be better. And that's one of the things that, as Minister, I've tried to do. This, this pandemic has set us back uh, quite a bit, but I think it's through the support of this House, through the support of the Executive, that we can get a health service that has been invested in, and a health service that we can and should be proud of. Members, that concludes questions on the statement. If you would please take your ease while we prepare for the next item of business.